The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. As the global economy has become more integrated and competitive in recent decades, nations have had to engage in intense international trade negotiations to open up new overseas markets while encouraging the growth of businesses and jobs back home. What are these negotiations like? And what is the United States interest? How do free trade agreements work? Who benefits and who doesn't? Here to provide an insider's look at the high-stakes game of international trade deals is Ambassador Susan Schwab, former United States Trade Representative under President George W. Bush. And now, Doug Besheron. Susan Schwab, welcome back to Policy Watch and welcome back to the University of Maryland. Thank you. Especially welcome back after uh, a stint as U.S. Trade Representative. What is a U.S. trade representative? <laughs> it, it is our equivalent of a trade minister that you would find in another country. It is a cabinet level position, but it is within the executive office of the president as distinct from like uh, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Commerce. Uh, it, is a position, uh, it has the title of ambassador. It was created in uh, 1962. Uh, and it was created in part because the uh, Congress of the United States felt that the State Department, which was up until that point responsible for US trade policy, uh, that the State Department favored or focused on the foreign policy implications and didn't focus on US economic uh, uh, benefits or U.S. economic interest uh, as part of the equation. And so what was set up was this office within the executive office of the president that is that, that operates in conjunction with all the other agencies. Uh, you know, the State Department has a legitimate interest in trade, the Agriculture Department, the Commerce Department, the Labor Department, uh, various agencies in the White House. And um, the USTR office convenes these sort of concentric circles of uh, agencies. Uh, does a lot of consultations with the Congress, does a lot of consultations with the private sector, with uh, you know, advisory committees of, of labor, of industry, of agriculture, services. How big? How many people? Uh, the Trade Representative's Office itself is very small by, by U.S. government standards, 230, 230 individuals. Um, we had over a thousand advisors, uh, private sector, um, public sector type uh, uh, advisors that we would turn to, as well as various committees on the Hill, and of course the multiplier, the multiplier that you have with other agencies, and you uh, would draw on the expertise of other agencies depending on the issue, depending on the negotiation. Now, especially being within the executive office of the president, I take it what a trade representative does, the priorities, and so forth, are particularly um, connected to the priorities of the president? Uh, very much, I mean, very much so, yeah. In the last 40 years, since, 45 years, since 1962, give us a sense of the changes that have taken place in what the U.S. Trade Representative does, what the priorities are. I, as I know that's a, but it might be helpful before we start talking about, yeah. Uh, that, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I guess, Start with, an, start with the role of the USTR, which is to advise the president, negotiate trade agreements on behalf of the president, enforce trade agreements uh, on behalf of the United States. Um, uh, we had as many negotiations with the United States Congress as we did uh, the foreigners uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, during, during my tenure and, and that of some of my predecessors. But the role has gotten more and more complex as the nature of international trade and international trade rules have become more and more complex. I mean, the original trade agreements that were negotiated after uh, you know, Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act 1930, the United States raised 20,000 uh, tariffs on 20,000 items. 
uh, which precipitated copycat and retaliatory action around the world, uh, which deepened and prolonged the Great Depression. We figured out that that probably was not a good idea. Um, Congress uh, decided that maybe Congress shouldn't be making trade policy on a day-to-day -day basis, and there was a shift of, of responsibility, delegation of authority to the executive branch. But at that point, all trade, virtually all trade issues revolved around tariffs and cutting tariffs. And a tariff is a tax, it just happens to be a border tax, and falls under the jurisdiction of uh, the tax writing committees of Congress, the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. Well, fast forward, uh, you get to 19, the 1960s, uh, and for the first time, one of the multilateral trade negotiations starts to address anti-dumping. Dumping, dumping mm -hmm. being the sale of a product at, at less than the cost to produce it, you know, in another market. It's a, it's a predatory trade practice. Uh, and Congress wasn't, wasn't ready to have the executive branch do that kind of a deal. Uh, so different kinds of authorities had to be delegated. Then you start, you have agriculture, you've got industry. You go beyond tariffs and you're talking about unfair trade practices like dumping, like subsidization. You're talking about services for the first time. You're talking about investment for the first time. You're talking about using sanitary and phytosanitary barriers as an excuse to keep agricultural products out, SPS issues. And so all of a sudden, you know, when I describe the concentric circle of agencies, what used to be a handful of agencies, all of a sudden, you know, the FDA has to be there, and um, the, uh, uh, you know, APHIS, uh, in, in, in the APHIS, APHIS being, oh, um, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, part of the, um, part of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, but you have all sorts of agencies and parts of agencies, including some independent agencies, that have never played a role before, and you need to bring that. And yet a very important one if some of the E. coli and whatever come from Absolutely. imported um, uh, fruits and vegetables, if Chinese products are unhealthy, um, and so forth. But you can, you can, I mean, that's a very good example of why you want a rules-based trade regime to address these things. Um, on the one hand, you want to make absolutely certain that the, that the food that you are eating, that you are, whether it's imported or domestic, is safe. That the toys your kids are playing with um, aren't, uh, you know, painted with lead-based paint. So you want your, your consumer protections. But this must be a giant problem because, excuse me, we're told don't eat the, any vegetable or fruit you can't cook or, you know peel when we're abroad, and yet we're bringing this food over here. But How before a fruit or vegetable is allowed to be exported to the U.S., there is extensive testing on the ground in those countries, and each product has to be approved by product by country, okay? So it took 18 years for the um, Indians to be allowed to ship to the United States mangoes. And, really? and wow. Indian mangoes, if you've ever had an in Indian mango in the spring, it is absolutely magnificent. Mm -hmm. It took 18 years for them to get through our regulatory process. Um, and there are many countries that can't ship us, can't ship us uh, uh, produce. Um, we don't import beef from a lot of countries because of the prevalence of hoof, hoof and mouth disease. We don't import products where there's a prevalence of, of fruit flies, for example. So every single uh, agricultural product is tested over there before it ever comes in. And, and some would argue that our regulatory process is a non-tariff barrier, um, uh, in part because of the length of time it takes to move through the pipeline. But flip it on the other side. You flip the other side, you look at, uh, um, for example, when the H1N1 flu virus started mm -hmm. circulating, which was referred to as swine flu, but it, it really, you know, it's not fair to the pigs because it wasn't the pigs' fault. Uh, but a lot of countries use that as an excuse to shut their market to U.S. exports of pork. And we're a major pork producer, a major pork exporter. Um, we are a major uh, exporter of beef. If I had to pick one issue that I probably spent 
you know, commodity specific issue I spent more time on when I was USTR than anything else. It was access for US beef exports because these SPS, you know, sanitary and phytosanitary measures are used as an excuse for import protection by other countries. Uh, and some of those countries would argue we do the same. So let's talk about the trade agreement process. And let's start with the broad ones. Um, the most recent famous Doha round of talks for the GATT, general assistance. It's, well, it was general agreement on tariffs and trade, which is uh, as of the, it was sort of subsumed in the 1990s by the World Trade Organization. Now, before we talk about the specifics, what's the role of these agreements and these organizations? It's not to open all borders to all things. No, no, these are, these are the most, this is like three-dimensional chess. It is the most complicated set of negotiations, I believe, taking place internationally in the world today. Because if you think about it, uh, the WTO has 153, 154 members. Uh, each member has thousands and thousands of tariff lines and your international and your domestic practices, all of which are theoretically on the table and you horse trade across. And so what you try to do is you try to come up with some formulas that for tariff cutting, for example, or rules of the road when it comes to subsidization or dumping and, and, and so on. So those, those rules of the road are, are negotiated. Uh, and then you have sort of the individual give and take. Um, most of the decisions are taken and most of the commitments are made and obligations are undertaken by about two dozen countries. Uh, most of the developing countries get a path get a pass, certainly the, the, the smaller, poorer ones. But the big debate in the Doha round um, is... Let's it, go back. So Doha, 2001? 2001, 2001, 2001. December 2001 was launched in, in, in Qatar, uh, Qatar, depending on how you, you pronounce it, uh, in the city of Doha. And the purpose was? Uh, it, is, it, it is the eighth round of multilateral trade negotiations as ever to promote more openness, more trade, and more economic development. This one is, is geared uh, to uh, economic development and developing countries as much as any that we've had in the past, with the developing countries having a, having a very influential role in the negotiations. And if I think I've, I have my history right here, partly, at least in its final shaping, it's a response to 9-11 and the administration's argument or at least the trade, that trade representative's argument uh, that terrorism comes in part from world poverty and we ought to be making developing countries uh, more affluent. Uh, it, it comes, it, it is sort of a fundamental view in a post-Cold War world that you cannot separate that which is economic and that which is, quote, traditional foreign policy. And that if, uh, un unless you have um, opportunities for growth uh, and a future uh, for individuals, young people around the world, whether it's in the Middle East or Africa or Asia, uh, you're going to have unrest. Um, you will have failed states and you have, um, you know, atmospheres that are ripe for, for terrorism um, and some pretty ugly things that have repercussions uh, all over. But yes, that's, it's sort of part of that fundamental vision. It is, however, as most of these trade negotiations are, it is also an opportunity to do the right thing domestically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, while leveraging benefits internationally. But help so us, help there's us. a self-interest, th there is a self, there's an economic self-interest with, that is part of a mutual self-interest among the countries participating in these negotiations. For the other trade uh, barriers or routes, not just to the U.S., is this developing country to developing country? Is this developing country to it, the it's, U.S.? It, it, the obligations that you undertake, for the most part, in these negotiations, in, in WTO, you know, multilateral trade negotiations, are to every other member. But the, but the purpose under the Doha round, what, to it's just it's the purpose under the Doha round is is not dissimilar to the purpose for, of every other round, but which but is new, but new countries, but, but bringing no, in more no, no, developing no. countries. No, it's it's market liberalization. 
uh, for any member of the WTO. Uh, it does, uh, the membership of the WTO has grown quite dramatically since 1947 when the GATT was, was, first, uh, was first launched. Uh, there is now uh, an opportunity for these emerging markets, these advanced developing countries, not just to be beneficiaries of the round, so but to be contributors to do, So now they have well. to do something. Okay, so let's get to the negotiation process here. Um, Doha, main players are? Main national players, what countries? Uh, in, in sort of the, the, the WTO works by consensus, which makes it an adventure. Uh, but, but you have obviously the US, you've got the EU, uh, European Union, 27 member countries. Uh, you've got China, you've got India, you have Brazil. Uh, sort of that's a core group. Australia has been very much involved in the core group activities. Uh, Japan plays in and out. Um, Indonesia is a, is a key player. There are groups of countries uh, that, uh, you know, groups of developing countries, groups of countries that don't want to open their markets to manufactured goods, groups of countries that are import sensitive in agriculture, groups of countries that are, you know, this is the developing country block. I mean, you've got, you've got lots of, of um, For sure. lots of, of, of uh, communities of interest, uh, but, but really the core, Group you know, is the, eight the or core ten is, is yeah. about eight or 10 countries. Okay. So developed and developing countries. Right, right. I'm sure there's a staff process ahead of time, and I'm sure there are emails and documents. But then you get together. What's that like? Uh, one thing that you learn in trade agreements and trade negotiations is that nobody gives you their bottom line during work hours. <laughs> so the fundamental rule of negotiating trade agreements is You'll, if you're going to get the deal, it's somewhere between 2 a.m. and you know 7 a.m. the next morning. Now I read one negotiator. I can't remember what country he was from during the Doha round. Thought that brown bread and bananas kept him awake at night, fresh. This is true. Well, there, everyone has their own little idiosyncrasies. And yours and, was? Uh, uh, mine was trying to make sure that I got at least a little bit of sleep and that I got exercise. Um, I, and ate right. I mean, you, you, you just have to do sort of fundamental, you know, fundamental things for your body. Uh, but getting fresh air, we used to walk. I mean, I did a lot of walking. Uh, and if the only time you could walk is, you know, 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., you'd make sure you had uh, enough folks around or security around so that you could walk around. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you just, that's the nature of the, of the beast. But you, but, so you end up, you, you have there's a lot that goes on, uh, again, concentric circles, mm -hmm. small groups of staff, senior staff, slogging through a lot of the technical issues, the formulas, running numbers, testing each other's uh, sensitivities. And you're supposed to not, you, you know, it's, it's only the major issues and major questions that are supposed to bump up to the ministerial level or the sub-ministerial level. Unfortunately, in the Doha round, a lot more of that, more than that has bumped up to the ministerial level and sometimes even the, the leader level because of the complexity. And because quite frankly, when you get to the eighth round, you know, this is sort of the eighth multilateral trade round, all the easy stuff was done before. You know, it's the only stuff that's left is the hard stuff, right? Yeah. It's, it's tariff peaks that have been protecting, you know, import sensitive, powerful constituencies in every country for a long time. It's agricultural subsidies. It's, it's just tough political slogging for every country involved. Now, I imagine at some point it's the nation's national interest, the country's national interest, and the instructions from the home government. But what you're describing is a, an intensely personal process as oh, yeah. well. So personalities must be involved. Um, animosities and friendships or alliances must develop outside of just national interests. If you think about the nature of the U.S. trade representative uh, compared to other trade ministers, you have some trade ministers who are politicians, you know, who are elected parliamentarians who are ministers. You've got some sort of more bureaucratic folks who came up through the bureaucratic ranks. Different, different political parties, 
with a negotiation like the Doha round that's been over eight years, you've had a lot of changes of political parties and leaderships and trade negotiators. Including in our country. Including now. in our country. That's exactly right. But no, personalities do, do count for better or for worse. Independent of their country's interests sometimes. Correct. And there's some people who you know, will tell you privately that they know it's in their country's interest to do this, but politically, you know, they got an election coming up and the party's in trouble and there's a weak coalition and we got to get past the election. And so if you have 153 countries, you got an election going on, you know, everyone's got elections going on. So there's no perfect time to close a trade deal. Yeah. Now, there's something you said a few minutes earlier that I want to pick up on again. You talked about the macho of some of these discussions. And so I was thinking, you know, my picture of these negotiations is a bunch of guys. And then I realized we've had at least three U.S. trade representatives who are women. And I think there are other women involved in this process. Yeah. It, it, it's, trade is a really good field. It has been a, a good field for women. I am, as you said, the, the third USTR uh, who is a woman. Like, nobody cares. It wasn't a big deal, you know. Uh, which is as it should be. Uh, I had a number of women counterparts, uh, the, uh, including, you might be surprised to learn, from some, from some uh, Muslim countries. Uh, the trade minister uh, of Indonesia is a woman. She's a PhD economist. Uh, the trade minister of the United Arab Emirates is a woman. Uh, the uh, new, um, the, the, the current EU commissioner, uh, so the, the Commissioner for Trade for the European Union, uh, the European Commission, uh, is a woman. Uh, so there are, there are some women. Uh, it's a field that, interestingly enough, in the United States, women got into fairly early on, generally through foreign languages. They were studying foreign languages or they were studying foreign policy, international relations. The guys, the guys were off doing, you know, political military stuff, throw weight, right? And the women uh, discovered that if you, you know, who, the women who had taken foreign policy courses or language courses took an economics course and discovered trade and got into the field uh, early enough uh, so that they were able to move up through the ranks and be a factor. It's great. So your advice to aspiring? Take economics. <laughs> That's a good piece of advice, um, and this is a good time for us to turn to our audience for questions. But before that, let me thank Susan Schwab again for being with us. And uh, let me ask all of those, uh, those of you in the audience who have questions uh, to come on up to the microphone, and we'll take your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Craig Morgan. Um, I was very long time ago. I did some economics, but anyway. Um, what strategies do you think make sense for dealing with political opposition to trade liberaliza liberalization? Thank you. I, I think we are in a dangerous place right now. Um, I have felt uh, that the day the U.S. becomes partisan about trade, we also become protectionist, uh, and that trade really needs to be bipartisan. Uh, the fight, the, the knockdown drag out going on within the Democratic Party uh, is is um, related to the relationships that the Democratic Party, a lot of Democratic members of Congress have with with organized labor. Uh, but it's interesting if you go to mayors and governors, uh, including a lot of prominent Democrats who are mayors and governors, uh, they understand how important trade is to their economies, to to you know the the economic growth and development opportunities and jobs in their jurisdictions. Uh, I think if, if the proponents of trade weren't so intimidated, uh, they would be speaking up more. I think uh, the, the point I made earlier about looking after those individuals and those communities that are, ne that are negatively impacted by trade, I think that is important. Uh, and some of the broader um, uh, investments that would enable us to feel more competitive and to have uh, more uh, competitive opportunities. But it, it's a combination. But I will tell you, without leadership, without leadership on the part of the president, um, uh, we're not going to go there. We can't go there. And this administration hasn't yet figured out really what it wants its trade policy to, to be. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. 
Uh, hi, sir. Uh, my name is Alex. Um, I'm a student uh, with the uh, School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. And I have a question. My colleagues would like to ask, uh, what do you think would be the most uh, challenging and the biggest business opportunity in terms of trade and investment between U.S. and China? Thank you. I think an area that, that I would like to see more work uh, between China and the United States is on uh, clean climate, clean energy technologies, uh, which China needs desperately, uh, and we need, uh, and the rest of the world needs. And what we should be doing is partnering to get other countries to reduce their trade barriers uh, to environmentally friendly technologies. Uh, because both China and the United States are major producers and exporters of those kinds of uh, products. Thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, Susan Schwab, former U.S. Trade Representative, now professor at the University of Maryland. Thank you very much for being with us at Policy Watch, and thank you all for being with us. Give, join me in giving her a great hand. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.